okay. So this is going to um, wait. Just checking something. So, yeah. Since la since last weekend, I did get some things here working a little better. So, as noted, well, I have file extensions now, and so on, and subdirectories work, so on. But, you know, recent work has been mostly splitting things up so that um, effectively the kernel stuff and the program stuff are separate and it uses system calls for um, doing things like low level ma memory management and file system and similar. Similarly, I can now also um, exit from programs and return back here. So, As can be noted, I exited quick and I am now back at the shell. Similarly, you fire up dim. music's not working right now, partly because um, music depended on the timer interrupts in order to work, and um, currently with the split in place it's not forwarding the timer interrupts into Doom, so it doesn't update the music. I'll probably change that. It's either forwarding the timer interrupts into Doom so that it can update the MIDI playback or alternatively possibly adding some MIDI related features into test turn itself. So. plan with test current isn't really to try to make it um, a full featured OS or to be competitive with something like Linux or similar, but more so because more so it's something relatively quick and dirty so I can have some semblance of a functional OS without needing to go through the effort of trying to port over something like Linux. Somehow I suspect um, Somehow I suspect a full Linux port over to PGX2 would be quite a bit more effort than 
throwing something together. Yep. Similarly, um, a full port would also require um, porting GCC and similar. And dealing with the fact that even uh, a lot of the simple GNU user land programs and stuff for a basic Linux distribution are also written in C++ as well. So um, they wouldn't really work with my current compiler, even if it was sufficient, if it turned out to be sufficient for compiling the Linux kernel. So yeah. With Quake, if I exit, should go back to the command line. Unless it crashes. And it worked. Currently, there's no logic in place to reclaim the um, memory from launch processes, so launching. Uh, Doom and Quake and similar will eventually use up all the RAM and probably cause it to crash. And I'll address that part later. Main thing with this is figuring, figuring out a good way to associate the um, page-related allocations with whatever happens to be the currently running task. It's, this could be done either by keeping um, a list of all memory allocations for a given task, which is one possibility, or another of which would be um, in the page management code to f associate every um, allocated page with a PID or similar, so, so that it can, when a process terminates, scan through scan through all the allocated pages and see um, which ones belong to a now terminated PID and free those up. But I've not yet, not yet to decide on the specifics there. Um, I'm probably more likely going to keep track of all allocations explicitly because that's more friendly with the use of 4k byte pages keeping track of PID and other information with 4k byte pages would be a lot more of a overhead to make that viable or to make that really viable I'd need to choose another option like say increasing the logical page size to 4K, or actually to 64K bytes, similar to how it, how it works on Windows. But, um, status of that is not done yet, and a bit uncertain. Another news had been working on a, also redoing the PE cough loader. Though it's not really true PE cough anymore, but just too many hacks, but yeah. It is structurally pretty related to PE cough and um in the base in the basic case would be backwards compatible with normal PE images, but there's a lot of tweaks. For example, um, this P variant can optionally omit the completely omit the MZ stub. So 
basically, yeah. Tricks for the MC stub and um, and also check check for um and the exact logic here is a little bit harder to discern because you have to convert out or hex back to ASCII to figure out figure out this I think checks for P I think M C okay yeah so it doesn't doesn't if it's not P and it's not M C then signature fail and otherwise yeah it goes and fetches the offset from OX3C which is how it would work in a normal um, P cough image with the MC, MC stub and checks that to make sure it has the P signature Otherwise, <coughs> otherwise it would, you know, have the P signature at the start of the file, and if it has the L4 suffix, then it's using the PEL4 variant, which is similar to the normal P cough, except it um, uses a variation of LC4 to compress most of the image. This saves some space and makes um, loading a little bit faster. <coughs> and this note can be noted, yeah. In this case, the P header starts right at the start of the file, rather than um, rather than some distance after the start of the file. Whereas with the MZ stub, you could present you could um, potentially have a small DOS executable or similar in that area, but that would be ignored in this case since it's well pretty much completely not relevant to test kern. Would be relevant to DOS, but um, yeah. And it wouldn't really matter for DOS or Windows either because these binaries um, would be kind of useless on a normal x86 system. So in this case it's pretty much a reasonable option if um, Windows is just like looks at it and it's like I have no idea what this is. So, in this case it checks that the machine type is uh, B264, which is what I'm currently using for BJX2. supports both um, the P and P32 30, yeah, P32 and th P32 plus variants um, these slightly affect things like which ABI is assumed and other stuff like that and um, indirectly is keyed to the size or basically the size of the pointer Namely, with 32 plus, it will assume 64-bit point a 64-bit pointer size in a 
48 bit address space wars with just um, P32, it'll assume the use of um, a 32 bit pointer and a 32 bit address space. And yeah, so slightly different header, header loading. Creates an image context, an image context for holding some of the stuff, and um, yeah, loads the contents into memory. Um, in the current version, it does some impose some restrictions on the format. Particularly, it imposes that the files file offset and RVA be equivalent. So that it can just load directly or directly into the target area of memory. This potentially wastes a little bit of space in some cases, but not too unreasonable. Those being clever, yeah, though a slight clever trick is to overlap some sections, um, namely sections that um, can all, that are only needed at um, sure. yeah sections that are only needed during program loading, such as the relocation section, and similar can be overlapped on top of BSS since there's typically no actual nothing actually loaded from mem or from the image into BSS. And when the program finish finishes loading, then it will overwrite all that area with zeros and use it as a BSS area. That is technically allowed for the PEL4 format as well, so but other other than that, um, other than that, like a RVAs are required to be equal to file offsets. Oh. Does print out like how m much it's loaded and similar. So here, if the if the GBR size is not zero, um, basically that indicates that it's using TBO. So it'll assign it an index and um, add the image to the list of PBO images. And after, or after that, it applies relocations and sets up some pointers. This stuff isn't done yet, so it's dubs for now. Kind of pretty nasty code, but this is just sort of copy pasted from my former quick and dirty loader that's intended for static for statically linked images with no re no relocations done PBO is a little bit more complicated than the static case but not too unreasonable so the static case so goes from line 64 to lines 205 so about a about hundred and something lines needed for the main stuff related to loading loading a static P image with the but with cases for both the un uncompressed and LC4 compressed variant 
the rest of the lines for this file are just for unpacking the LC4 variant where can be noted LC4 is a relatively simple compression format it um yeah you know, it's basically byte byte oriented with so there's a tag byte where values other than 15 indicate well they're just packed together so you have a length of raw literal bytes and a length for the match and if either of those is 15 it means it doesn't fit in that single tag byte and it will um, load a chain of bytes to figure out how long it is and it will copy over the literal bytes and if it hits the end of the buffer it will stop or hits the end of the input buffer it will stop and um, yeah Yeah, so it copies literal bytes and then checks if it's hit the end and then it will copy all the remaining batch bytes. Um, <coughs> it will copy the remaining match bytes into the output as well. So these copy from position relative to the current end of the buffer. is a special case so the distance is greater than 8 they'll just copy 8 bytes at a time whereas if it's the distance is less than 8 <coughs> means it <coughs> means the matches are self overlapping so I'll copy bytes instead here this could be more efficient but this is um, a simple version Yeah, as no can be noted, instead of um, storing the entire image as a or entire compressed image as a single large LC4 block, it's instead basically broken up uh, into one k byte chunks. So the logic for encoding the PE image will try to basically fit as much as it can into a 1k byte block and we'll write that out and then it'll con continue packing the more data into the next 1k byte block and so on. This does mean the unpacker needs to also take mind of it be packed into 1k byte blocks or into fixed size 1k byte blocks as well but nothing too unreasonable. This, of course, is partly to work around for limited or for allowing this to operate in a relatively limited memory footprint. <coughs> it doing it as a single doing it as a single large LC4 stream rather than small blocks would instead require reading the entire compressed version of the binary into RAM and then uncompressing it into its destination spot whereas if it's limited to 1k byte blocks we only need to read in 1k byte at a time and we're still able to unpack um, everything without need without need of a second buffer so our second large buffer Similarly, that's why LC4 is used rather than anything more complicated. This, <coughs> yeah, attempts at even the simplest possible um, 
compression scheme using using say Huffman coating or similar would be well quite a bit larger than the 60 lines here smallest I've got for um yeah uh, Huffman or for a Huffman compressed um LC77 variant is closer to around 200 lines but yeah it's mostly just trying to get clever with um, minimizing the amount of code to get even that small something like deflate is quite a bit bigger if I remember correctly my deflator is close or inflator is closer to about 800 lines or something so Oh yeah, simple case. As noted, this version doesn't actually allocate any memory for the image. It'll just naively um, load it to wherever it um, or wherever it's hard coded in the image. This makes sense for like something like a bootloader, which is partly where this version came from. And yeah, just working on replacing it with something that does it a little more properly. And doesn't just um, doesn't just load the image to a constant address in memory. The only reason in, in this early experimental form that it can um, not trash the or not trash the shells um, memory and stuff is because I sort of use different base addresses for the kernel than I did for the normal um, binaries. So, for example. <coughs> The bootload at bootload SYS, which contains the shell here, is loaded at the 16 meg mark, whereas Doom and Quake are currently loaded at the 32 meg mark. This gives around 16 megs, which is probably more than sufficient for the kernel, for the yeah for the kernel's data and BSS sections. That would create problems if by some chance I'd need um, more than 16 megs for all, for all the stuff in the kernel, but by that point I'll probably, I'll probably have this stuff over here written. So yeah, or written and working. As for Verilog simulations, well, not not too much is new there. Um, still need to debug debug more stuff stuff in there and try to get it closer to working or get everything closer to working. But figured I kind of needed some semblance some semblance of an OS assuming I actually make it to the stage of having um, 
having hardware, or yeah, being able to run it on actual hardware, so yeah. This here is in the emulator, or just in the emulator, but it's sufficient for testing this. Yes, the part I'm working on over here is more or less all in software. useful commands uh, still don't have much useful going here it can launch programs and it can do LS but yeah not a whole lot of interesting commands Oh yeah, I have CD. Now I have that done, it, that working at least. And I can do... Also, it's clever enough to... Um, recognize a double dot pattern. So it goes to ID one rather than than a more stupid looking path name. But yeah. The C D slash and Yeah, these work about as one might otherwise expect. Technically, they're done more via clever string processing than they are than by actual actually walking the directory tree, which would be more technically a more technically correct way of doing this, but sufficient for now. So, this is called, this is a little bit of a hack in terms of how it works. Basically, if it launches, well, if it's in kernel mode, then it will launch the fat driver, or if otherwise, it'll launch the syscall driver. The syscall driver is essentially like a file system driver. It'll just forward everything through syscalls. And stuff. Kind of like the Unix style um, syscalls. It uses integer handles for things internally. But, um, it's partly because didn't really didn't really want to use um, kern or kernel mode um, addresses and similar as handles because that's not necessarily great but would have technically worked.
similarly the actual syscalls are using the traditional um, Unix or POSIX style argument ordering rather than the STDIO style ordering. So first argument is the handle, second argument is the buffer, and third is the size. Well, not much notable. Similarly, the seek operation is used for both seeking and for tell. This is done as a, a special case, but not too notable. Probably, probably later we'll do a slightly more bare version of version of these system calls rather than the version that's done through the wrapper. This way you could do, you know, read commands directly. Well, the read system call directly rather than going through this wrapper. In this case, the going th directly through a system call could be a little bit more efficient because this is first, well, it's first wrapped via the TK, um, or TK file interface. And then this here is wrapped again in order to get the STDIO file interface. kind of point, which is in some ways kind of pointless, but I would otherwise need to rewrite the C library to get rid of the STDIO or whole STDIO file thing. And if I did that, if I were to do a full rewrite of the C library, then probably the TK file would just be alias to the stdio file, like a file type, and things like fread and similar would similarly simply forward, or simply forward the command over here. <coughs> As is the stdio code tries to do some additional levels of buffering and other stuff like that, which has led to trouble in the, pa in the past, but isn't quite annoying or ugly enough to where I considered completely redoing re re all that. So I've left it as is. So on the kernel side of the system call interface, it um, basically converts the handle back into a pointer and does stuff, checks if it's a special case for tail, and if it is, and it will do a tail operation. Otherwise, it'll just do an fseek operation. Also added an, an IOCTL interface. This isn't currently used for anything, but will be relevant once things like devices or similar are added. Uh, currently, no, currently no FCNTL or similar, but. Yeah, have to look into that some more. See if FCNTL could be routed via IOCTL, but
it's a good soul, maybe. So the to do is in in the future determine whether I need separate system calls for IOCTL and FCNTL or whether they can both be done via the same system call but leave that for another day <coughs> so yeah just two levels of forwarding so from one interface to system calls, then from system calls back over to the interface it would have been original at originally, just so it can cross a conceptual border between um, between the program and the kernel. You know, could theoretically direct call between them anyway or as well because you know they are operating in the same logical address space but and that's not really how suppose how OS's are supposed to work so and it would also make kind of a mess late if mess later if I decided to move them to separate address spaces which is a quite possible eventuality. This PBO is meant to allow multiple processes in the same address space. It's not meant to require it. And as such, um, yeah, the use of stuff related to one yeah, use of addresses from one process within another process will be effectively undefined. Even as such, it might still be disallowed because um, I do have do also have the key ring uh, or key ring uh, feature in the MMU, which is also designed to more or less check and enforce um, page, er, page level access within like a single process or single address space. Basically every page potentially has or every page pot potentially that's handled via the MMU can have effectively a UIG UID and GID associated with it. Um, similar goes for processes. <coughs> Unless both processes have the same UID and GID, then um, ability to, a to access memory from one process and another process could be effectively blocked. And idea here is it um, well what would be what would be a group in a traditional OS might possibly be used for a user here so the GID is effectively the actual user and then the um, UID might be actually associated with particular particular programs or particular processes Specifics are still up in the air here. The similarly, the UID and GID used for process might be separate from those used for file access. It's also to be determined. Partly because yeah wouldn't necessarily make sense for each running process to have its own local permissions. Usually we don't we only care about that on a
sparser granularity, namely the user level when it comes to file access. So Prowl thinks it might be useful to add its commands. And its commands might be things like copying and deleting. Yeah, things for copying files and deleting files and so on. And renaming. Be useful. Don't have those yet. Might also at some point try to figure out a good way to add symbolic links and file permissions and similar onto FAT32. These are <coughs> those would be um, a little bit more involved and require figuring out some specifics like how I'll do those in a way which won't break if it's uh, if the drive is accessed and modified via Windows or SIM more. Like, um, say if you just open up the drive with Windows and start copying stuff around, how do you avoid um, screwing up the metadata associated with all the files and other stuff like that? You don't necessarily want, um, a metadata file for each individual file because that would be a lot of overhead. And that was essentially how things worked in Mac though. Or, yeah, with with Bat on Mac. Effectively, it, there each file had an associated, well, data fork file and a resource fork file. And so Every file was two files and thus had a minimum of around two clusters. But, um, yeah, I don't want to do that this way here. And instead, probably there would be. It would probably be sim more like that of UMS DOS or similar. So you'd have um, <coughs> probably a hidden file in each directory that would contain or contain an associated mapping between file names and their additional metadata. could possibly cram short files in there or small files in there as well but then it carries the risk of um, small files not existing if viewed from Windows which would be potentially not ideal either so yeah mostly a thing of do you want to do you want to waste like a full cluster for a file that's um, only a few hundred bytes or do you want the file to not be end up not being visible from th something like Windows so trade-offs For sim links, it probably doesn't matter since um, sim links aren't really a useful concept for Windows, anyways. And, well, 
doing a raw copy of a directory tree will probably break the sim links. None of that for yet. Fat drive the fat driver in question does at least theoretically support long file names, so well, yeah. That's doesn't need to be nothing special is needed for for that at least. Chances are the chances are the metadata would be keyed to the short file name of each file rather than its long file name though. But that's mostly because nine or just treating it as an, as a ninety six bit value or matching would be cheaper and easier than treating it as a string. Also, since since in the current file system driver, it's not actually using long file names, or when it comes to long file names, it's not actually using the Windows style like whatever uh, tilde one uh, notation, but actually it's just store, sort of storing an i an id number slash hash in the or hash in the short name and Then, you then just using the long file name as the file name, if it doesn't fit within the normal 8.3 convention. Then again, I've not confirmed, not fully confirmed actually that that work, that long file names work yet, but I'll probably do so. The test here will be since I have well ls and similar, I can probably use this to confirm whether long file names are working as expected. And the answer is um Probably not. <coughs> so, looks like I'll have to fix fix LFN support. <sighs> this sort of thing is a process of well. Testing stuff and fixing stuff. In this case, I've tested it and confirmed that it doesn't work and will probably need to be fixed.
we'll see. Does changing Does that have any effect anything? Nope. Oh yeah. So, this means it prob the hashes probably didn't match for the long file name, so it didn't use the long file name. Um, so then it falls back, falls back to the route of trying to use the short file name as the name, but what happens, or what happened here is it all sees that it's just sort of <coughs> using the hacked hash, val hack hash value rather than the proper short name, so it probably, so it rechecks it. It starts with a value that's less than space. In other words, not in the ASCII range. It will assume it's not valid, and if it's if the case thing has this flag set, which I forget which bit that is offhand, but if it has that bit set, then it won't accept it as valid either. flags here which affect rather the whether the file name should be uppercase or lowercase. So fat always stores file names as uppercase but then it might convert them to lowercase when needed. And um stuff. So Similarly, it uses um, similarly it uses internal conversions going from the ASCII to um, the UCS character equivalent, which is straightforward given 
given like it's using 1252, but yes, it's a lookup table. And it emits a, the UTF-8 code point for that character. Which, well, a lot of this, a lot of the other code right now sort of assumes ASCII, but yeah, so it probably display is garbage, but uh, either way. Another flag affects the case of the file extension, which is similar. Each one is the set according to the um, directory entry. Um, check some. <coughs> check some of this, of course, a byte. it off to a bite as well. Well, the first step, creating a directory entry. It um, converts from UTF-8 to UCS-16. 
figures out how many characters there are in the name. And I think figures out how many directory entries you'll need to start the long file name. And makes a hash. So short name space zero byte and stores that hash as the short file name. And then a colon. Only so, um, this colon does overwrite the end of this checksum here, given it's two bytes, so. But I'm going to have to check. I think I wrote a spec for this if I take our feature. Of, um, my alter specs are relevant for some of the stuff I've been dealing with here. This stuff was originally developed as part of the BJX1 project, and um, well, Space zero.
no basically yeah that OX20 from before except if the name is not a valid 8.3 name basically this particular driver it treats it yeah it treats the short name and long name as sort of mutually exclusive but theoretically that's that's fine so long as um the long file name is always valid and i'm not aiming for dos compatibility or anything so don't have much reason to care about the short name So, it also supports a, at least specifies the support for the FAT plus form, format, which would extend the file size limit up to 256 gig rather than the usual 4 gig. But, um, Neither Linux, not neither Windows nor Linux supports this feature, so it um doesn't have that much use. Probably not related to the checksum issue, but may as well at least have a full 32 bit checksum. Let's see if this at least gets me somewhere close. Just giving it um, the full number of bytes.
Okay, yeah. So there was a hack in this spec to support more than 256 million clusters for the RAT32 variant, which, well, could sort of break stuff, but it allows larger volumes without, um, allows larger volumes without needing to use a larger cluster size, but not relevant, not quite as relevant here. Since like, yeah, <coughs> the SD cards I'm using are um, probably, yeah, probably just stock or normal FAT32 created by a normal formatter thus no need for fancy funky variants in that case. Okay, so it does cast it to bite. Basically, <laughs> yeah, has logic to where it, um, de try to decode the normal long file name entries, <coughs> and it'll um, then try to check whether the long file name goes to the short. To the directory entry and then try to either use that or reject it. And these
One is giving a hash of 42, the other is giving a hash of 46. going to see what this name looks like. So, so hash is now more bytes, but no. For whatever reason, the hash value is coming up different. So
pretty sure I got that hash function from somewhere, so I'm going to need to investigate to see how it works. That's different. Actually, wait. No, it doesn't use I in here, so that won't make a difference. No, I think I know what's going on. simple answer of what's going probably going on here. It's a special case of undefined behavior. Namely that this particular um calculation can overflow. But probable possible that two C two different compilers are giving different results in the overflow case. Okay. Long file name is now working. <clears throat> Basically What's going on here is, well, actually I'm not sure whether or not this case is defined for overflowing unsigned types. I think, yeah, signed overflow is required, or is undefined, but unsigned overflow. Not sure. Basically what was going on here is it looks like in ov the overflow case it was promoting or 
producing an intermediate value that was larger than the somatic type is supposed to support. So in this case it would promote it internally to a 32-bit value or similar. And with this here, right shift, any values that overflowed would get pulled in and have an effect on the result. I need to go investigate that case more and see if um, if the standards say anything useful about that. But in, it is simpler in this case to implicitly promote it to a larger type internally. So this byte here might be implicitly promoted to an unsigned in, an unsigned in internally. So any creative overflows will operate in int range rather than they rather than in byte range. So But it looks like MSVC was problem was actually enforcing the byte range. So since I don't think I actually rebuilt. could have technically also masked it, masked it off here for, for the same result. which is, while not functionally any different, slightly aesthetically better, because it matches this one here with this one here. The bootload sys is missing, missing its name. Hmm.
pretty sure bootload sys actually actually has a short actually has a short file name rather than long file name. So this should shouldn't be happening here. Is it, was it in uninitialized variables? I will see. Yeah, probably was. So, change those two hashes to negative one, which means it can't match by accident, which in this case has caused the file name to reappear. Probably also want something similar here. So, long file names now working closer to expected. Okay. So adding the dot sysys dot map, yeah that's working. As expected. Well I'm at it probably also makes sense to confirm if next case is working. Should work, but doesn't hurt to verify. Yep. Up 
case letters are working. So an amazing detour into the world of, you know, more teabagging of this fat driver. Lots of little bugs can be lur lurking in a fat driver, particularly one that's not w super well tested in these use case in use cases of well, actually having little directory listings and stuff. It's a bit more well tested in terms of opening files, but <coughs> as noted, Doom and Quake kind of use entirely short names rather than long names. <coughs> Chances are te the test current thing will pro <coughs> probably stick with this, the usage of um, traditional DOS and Windows file extensions and stuff. But we'll probably go with a more Unix-like Unix uh, directory tree organization. That's sort of at least the initial plan. So in that sense it will be a little bit more like CYG when the file organization will differ from Unix convention a little bit. Like I'm probably not going to strictly adhere to the whole um, slash USR slash bin slash lib um, whatever stuff but probably not going to go to the windows extreme of well sticking bunches of spaces and other stuff in the in the um system file names like program files and program files x86 what practical good reason is there for there to be a space and colon or and parentheses and so on? <coughs> All it does for a shell interfaces mean uh, more hassle and more typing. So, so in the name of not being annoying, we'll avoid the use of spaces and try to keep names relatively terse, but yeah. Well, um, probably we'll have <coughs> make or do things differently in the um, programs will natu naturally have their own associated directories, or probably have their own associated directories for binaries and files and stuff, rather than trying to cram everything into a single big unified directory tree. Is, well, sticking all the binaries in usr or in slash usr slash bin and all the data files and slash usr slash var or similar is kind of <coughs> a little bit annoying. <coughs> so so for example in this case 
if you had a Quake installation. You'd have like, you know, well, I have to figure out where I'd put it exactly, but probably some, slash something slash Quake with, you know, the binary and the ID one directory and stuff. So a little bit more like Windows in that sense, but probably probably things like us slash usr slash bin will still exist for um, all the really small programs that don't actually need their own dedicated directories. And for um, all system stuff. Makes sense. Should make sense. So it'll be kind of, would be kind of an intermediate, not really Windows and not really Unix in that sense. <laughs> Plan for things is, well, API stuff. If I develop it further, we'll probably go in a POSIX like direction. Because, well, at least it makes more sense to try to to try to port um, C, C code from Linux land and file, follow those conventions than to try to um, follow the horrible mess that is the Win32 API. And also, we'll POSIX is generally a little more acceptable for general use than Win32 API is, but yeah. So So yeah, will probably be something. So, say, this is the same. Oh, slash dev and slash usr slash bin and similar will be about So, yeah. These ones will probably follow follow Unix conventions and similar. Likewise, slash home slash Yeah. I'll just use myself as an example. So slash home will be traditional as well. So maybe there will be slash apps. So this might be where things get different. You have Quake installation, you might put it in slash app slash Quake. And that would in turn have your binary and your data files might go in there. so on. <coughs> so app, so for example apps dot er, slash app slash wake would have well as an example 
So you'll have your exe file which will run from this directory. Um, as noted, it won't be part of the path unless you add it to the path, but that's kind of how I'll go. Like Windows, path will be what will be searched for binaries. So. Probably. Maybe. Unless I have another library path. So it's either do it like this. So it searches in bin and in lib for exe files and dll's. Or I could do it. So it all search for binaries in path and libraries in LD path. But otherwise path and LD path would be functionally similar. Just one used for binaries and the other for um, libraries. On Windows it uses um, path for both, so well, hence you can put, for example, both DLLs and EXE files in System32. And if you type in a command that's in System32, well, then it's going to launch from there. So, yeah, hmm. Of course, doing it this way is a little bit more convenient because, well, then you don't need to deal with two separate environment variables, one for binaries and one for libraries. <coughs> um, similarly, if I go this route, go this route. It would also make sense for um, well, DL, things like DLL searches and whatever to also by default include whatever happens to be the, la or the launch directory of the binary for its um, DLL search path. So, in a special case, this would be in contrast to the whole like um, elf r elf r path thing, which is you know the major pain. It doesn't work very good. Like. This crap. Or, it would help if I spelled it right. Yeah. This crap here is like um, the nemesis of doing a lot of stuff on or building on Linux. Because sometimes it will work and sometimes it won't. And yeah. As of course, assuming I typed it correctly, which I have to check on that, but something like that. But I would prefer to avoid this particular annoyance. Instead, just wherever the binary happens to be, if there's DLLs in the same directory, as the binary, I'll search. I'll use those, and otherwise, if not, 
I'll just search the path as normal. Now as noted, started doing that here. In this case, um, in this case, each um, line of the path would probably be separated off into its own string, or its own string when doing um, the library search. But that's mostly for convenience. <coughs> so I'll include these as basically static paths and then there will be implicitly the program launch directory as um, a single dynamic path entry which it would also check but that would be not stored here but passed along um, probably do the loader commands so Probably, <coughs> if um, the image name is a full path, what it will do is it will grab that and it will split it up into the um, pre prefix part and use that to, as part of the um, path search or not. As in Windows convention, it's probably it's probably not going to include the full path in the image names, but instead it'll only um, store the last part. So, well, So say if you have libfoobar.dll, then it's going to ignore ignore the first part of the path part, and then it'll store the image name simply as libfoobar.dll. This means it will. This means like uh, dlls with the same basic name will assume to be equivalent regardless of where they are on the path. But you wouldn't necessarily always have lib in this case either, so it would probably also allow for that as well. This is this part's probably go, going to depend on, however, the program is linked. I could, if I wanted, just just go with using the SO extension instead, like. And so it use could possibly use SO instead, even with it using um, P cough internally. But yeah, but normally if a person sees SO, they they're kind of expecting it's probably ELF or something. And my current compiler, if it sees an SO extension, will also assume you want ELF, but. Yeah. <coughs> or as in a not more like P, P or PEL for rather than proper P cough, but either way. It's not L5 
not elf, so that's the important detail. As note well, as can be noted here internally it um, uses some function pointers for which version of the page alloc the page alloc function to use. So call it via the function pointers and there's L for local which allocates pages directly and V for somewhere. Oh yeah, there they are. So the V versions use the, the system call. And there's exit, because you know exit. But default seems to look on if it's not kernel mode then it switches over to the V functions. In this case, and yeah this is because they're still technically the same code for now and well also I can launch it via the shell or and launch it via the shell or I can do like I did before which should still work going a little bit slower but partly because I had recently built the emulator with debug settings. So if I go back down to 50 megahertz, see what it does. This version exits immediately rather than coming back to the shell because it was, well, not launched from the shell. So it tries to exit and it will check if it's in, in kernel mode and if it's not in kernel, er, 
if there's no kernel running underneath it, it will just trigger a breakpoint. It might, I might split it up further, like, um, later on, for example, for binaries that use DLLs, um, it makes no sense for them to do, th do it this way, since a binary using a DLL can never really fun be functioning as a, or as, um, a standalone kernel instance anyway, so, yeah. So this would, this whole thing would not make sense for static or for dynamically linked binaries, and would only make sense for statically linked binaries that may potentially be launched directly from the bootloader. Some of this stuff might change later. But still to be decided the sp some of the specifics of that. I don't actually know as of yet whether I'm going to going to do like Windows and statically link the C library to the binaries, or whether I'm going to do like Linux and typical and probably use a DLL for the C libraries, C library, or an SO in Linux case, but yeah. So, that's another one. So, yeah. So, whether I do something that's vaguely along these lines or not is still to be decided. If I go this route, then, well, I don't actually need to really care that much about whether this is kernel wank still exists because, well, um, won't have all that big of an effect overall. In this case, the binaries wouldn't need to have redundant copies of all that code because, well, they'll just be binaries and they'll be using a DLL.
this is more a case of me as well. So in this case is not yet tested. So we get launching the simula simulation and I will see what it does. Clearly it is tried to use wax at function. Mm -hmm. That part is still not really tested and debugged yet with when it comes to M. It's not really tested yet when it com comes to um, trout. When it comes to running the simulation, so WEX still needs more debugging before it's ready to go. But what I'm going to do is ironically just use a wider version of Wax which should have been should be theoretically supported. Um, Yeah, wider version of what should have been theoretically supported by the simulation, but um, currently it's not. And ironically enough, turning that on will cause it to effectively fall back to scalar mode. it gets to the shell however it um well it doesn't work but yeah typing stuff doesn't work but that's because the simulation still doesn't do PS2 it doesn't do the P2 
PS2 and put, which is probably makes sense to do. going to do likewise for core unit but don't expect that's going to really do much different. question is, will the full Verilog simulation be able to load correctly load the shell? I kind of have doubts since um, I think it's breaking somewhere <coughs> in the actual um, uh, breaking somewhere in the actual boot or boot process like uh, probably dealing with the FAT32 or something, but yeah. So I don't expect it's going to change that much with what ha what happens here, but it might. Special note is that, like, yeah, debugging CPU cores is kind of a pain. The progress is slow. And I've still not, as of yet, found the bug that's preventing it from loading. I guess it could be argued it's either a case if I'm not looking hard enough or maybe like well or maybe cer certain people are right and I actually don't know what I'm doing here but whatever the case. It's not really necessarily the point of this effort to, you know, have a firm grasp on everything a person's doing and why, but how much is, you know, just doing, just do it.
it's a hobby project. I don't necessarily expect to change the world. I'm just more expecting to, well, do stuff and probably just squander a bunch of time doing so, but whatever. At least it's vaguely interesting. Or at least interesting for person that can be prone to being a little bit overly obsessive about technical trivia. Yes, unlike normal people, which are sufficiently content to just spend all their time watching TV, but uh, personally, I don't understand how they avoid getting or how they avoid getting painfully bored. Is there's not that much interesting on TV. Enough maybe for like momentary in momentary entertainment, but not enough to justify spending one's whole life watching TV. This contrasts with the, you know, normal person doing normal person things. Like, they give their life to their job and then spend all their off time watching TV and drinking is more or less the standard person lifestyle. But more interesting personally to, well, do the job thing and then with what time I have left, continue doing personal projects, even if progress is pretty slow. Yeah, even if progress progress is pretty slow, and it's been some odd number of weeks that I've still not figured out what's going on there. What I do know is about it is, yeah, probably for some reason, the F read call is returning zero before it should.
yeah, given it not point coming out by just trying to yeah, given the issue is not showing up by just trying to um mess with the unit tests and whatever may as well go the higher level route see if I can identify where the issue is coming from maybe go and then try to work backwards and figuring out figure out what's misbehaving or at least where it could be coming from And of course, forgot an important step. So, in the full simulation, unless one rebuilds the ROM in it, or does a rebuild ROM command, um, or build ROM. Man, then the um, actual ROM image of the Verilog uh, module sees is a little bit out of date. possible but completely funny would be if it turned out to be due to, it, to uninitialized variables. You know like this uninitialized variable has a slightly different value depending on whether it's the whether or not it's a simulation or which simulation it is. again since I saw that was being an issue earlier with the other version. <coughs> 
with um, slightly more correctly behaving CPUs. You may as well at least to tr try to address it here. And it wouldn't really affect, it shouldn't really affect the ROM given. Yeah. Yeah, it shouldn't affect the ROM given. The ROM doesn't actually use lo long file names. know is first read works correctly returns one k byte second read returns a negative one repeat process Let's see what this says.
looks like it's trying to read from one K byte, but Okay, so it doesn't have seek back to the start on this one. <clears throat> and we'll, <clears throat> and we'll instead um, it will instead try to continue reading from where it was. And of course the next read attempt to read kinda fails. mark off a few locations where it can potentially generate a negative result.
Path or task here is figure out where that negative one is coming from. This process is not super exciting. So this failed along the two way path. So necessarily need to print here since looking at it there's only one place that can come from
two paths exist and testing out to see which one it is. open question is do I have anything more to talk about right now <coughs> mm, I will see Debugging, um, similarly, debugging the Verilog simulations itself goes at glacial speeds, which no oh, partial reason why it's not getting debugged faster. <coughs> Started working on trying to um, split up things into a separate kernel and um separate kernel and like shell or er, and program and <coughs> talking is escaping me yeah started splitting things up mostly because once i get to actual hardware that would probably be a useful thing to have doesn't appear anyone has stopped in. Yeah. Well. We got an E off, and question is, what cluster? I'm at it. See if it's different if I like go the always do the full walk case. This is Oh, 
always walking. The fall chain is one of those things that gets pro progressively slower, but it um, useful for debugging in this case. See if by some chance um, this logic here isn't working right. Oh yeah, seeing here if um yeah, basically it's possible that some something invalid has gotten in here, which might have been interfering with it, namely in terms of the cluster walking the cluster chain walking logic or fat chain walking logic. Basically, we know here in this case, cluster is zero. Cluster ID is getting passed in from the caller. It's tailing number three point.
much obvious here right now. Apart from, it looks like there's a case where Astro is returning zero. Yeah, we'll probably continue debugging this, but probably off stream because this is, well, not being super obvious. Yeah. Try to read from L LBA of negative one, which may need further investigation, but I've been streaming for three hours and I will call this good. <laughs> 